how about we deep dive into the beer garden physics of engine operation, specifically anything to do with engine knock and octane rating and all of that good stuff that if you get it wrong at high speeds and big throttle inputs, you can catastrophically destroy your engine. <laughs> yes, so that's nice. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au, the place where Australian new car buyers save thousands of their brand new cars. Hit me up on the website. Oh, that. I got these two questions in close proximity over the past couple of days, okay? And they're from two different dudes. One never knows, of course, but I assume they're from two different dudes and they relate to all of this stuff, octane ratings and RON ratings and MON ratings and Aki, and it plays into, you know, what causes knock and what is knock and how do you avoid it and what happens as engines age and, you know, turbocharging versus Atmo, there's that. We'll drill down into all of this stuff and I thought, what a fantastic opportunity during this mad social isolation lockdown experiment at Easter for you to give a profound gift to those you love, mainly by withdrawing yourself from them into your own fat cave for half an hour or something, I don't know, as long as it takes, so that they can do whatever and you can kick back and relax and, I don't know, strap on your fishnets and your flip-flops and think about the village people. There's no shame. It's your fat cave. No one's going to judge. And we can talk about this. I think that'd be nice. So the first thing I think we've got to talk about here is the breathtaking speed of engine operation because some mundane engine, like let's take a two-litre engine in a Toyota Corolla. No one's going to be doing handsprings about that engine anytime soon. It's like the mediocre engine in mainstream life, okay? 6,000 RPM, I guess, is where it makes its maximum power. You need wide open throttle and you need to be against a balancing load. And that could be up a really, really steep hill or, I don't know, against an inertial load and aerodynamic drag at VMAX, whatever. But it has to be against a balancing load. And then you get to generate maximum power. But 6,000 RPM is, in fact, brain-bendingly fast. And my own limited cognitive capability has difficulty relating to it in a practical way because every time I blink my eye, like blink, world goes black, open, world comes back, and you don't notice it ever unless you're consciously made aware of the process. You're losing one-tenth of a second of reality. It's just like losing it like that, okay, every time. That's 10 revolutions, okay, at 6,000 RPM. Because 6,000 RPM, 100 revolutions a second, one blink of an eye, 10 revs. And it's a four-stroke engine, okay? And each cycle of those four strokes takes two revolutions. So suck, squeeze, bang, and blow takes two revolutions. That's about five milliseconds, 5, 10, 15, 20 milliseconds for two revolutions, to complete one cycle. So sucking the fuel-air mixture in, five milliseconds. Squeezing it, five milliseconds. Bang and the power stroke, five milliseconds, and then blow out the exhaust, five milliseconds. This happens preposterously quickly, repeat. Even at 3,000 RPM, which I think you'd agree is mediocrity personified. Nobody goes, I got my engine up to 3,000 RPM today. <laughs> Nobody says that. But the speed of operation of all the bits is just still brain bending. Like the four strokes, each one of them takes the blink of an eye, about 10 milliseconds. One blink of an eye to suck in the mixture. Another blink of an eye to squeeze it. Another blink of an eye to burn it and throw the piston down to the bottom of the stroke to extract the mechanical work and drive the car forward, and another blink of an eye to exhaust the spent mixture and start again. So, come on, 3,000 RPM is just so impressive when you think about it. How engines don't just blow up every time they try and work is a flat-out miracle. And when you think about it, it's even more complex than that because precise events have to happen within the timing of each one of those strokes. For example, 
the spark plug needs to fire at exactly the right time relative to the position of the crankshaft and the valves have to open and close at precisely the right times as well. Typically, when it comes to the spark plug, it's firing 40 degrees, between 40 degrees and 10 degrees before the piston gets to top dead centre. And that allows the flame front to propagate through the mixture and generate enough pressure to throw the piston down properly when the crank gets just past top dead centre and the piston starts moving down. So all this stuff really matters and it happens super quick and a lot can go wrong. Before we talk about what can go wrong, a lot of people think this process involves exploding the mixture in the cylinder. And although the process happens quickly, it's not an explosion, okay? It's combustion. And if you want to drill down into that even further, there's two flavours of combustion. There's detonation and deflagration okay everyone's heard of detonation because we've seen a michael bay movie and we've watched you know documentaries about warfare and stuff like that and seen buildings getting blown up when they want to take them down and uh, mining is another great user of detonation so high explosives detonation everything else like striking a match or lighting the stove if you've got gas or, you know, burning a campfire and what goes on in your engine, that's the process of deflagration. The difference between them is the speed of the flame front, okay? So in detonation, you get a supersonic flame front and a supersonic shock wave, and that's what does the damage, and that's why high explosives are different to stuff that just burns. Stuff that just burns deflagrates, and the speed of the flame front is subsonic. So... If you've ever seen a Michael Bay movie and you get those massive red flame, balls of flame that happen all the time to simulate the Hollywood equivalent of high explosive, that's usually just a ball of like LPG that burns in air, okay? If it was proper high explosive, you wouldn't see a ball of flame like that. You'd just get a supersonic shockwave that flattens something. And the best examples of that that I can think of are the old nuclear test videos where they do those nuclear explosions and they put up fake buildings and watch the shockwave rip them to pieces. That's detonation. Deflagration is if you've ever played around with petrol which you should not do because it's properly dangerous friggin' stuff. But if you have ever played around with petrol and, you know, you throw the match in and you hear, that's that subsonic kind of shockwave and it's really subsonic. So you feel it, but it doesn't rip the flesh from your bones and knock down the house. You need actual detonation for that. So just for disambiguation, what's going on inside your engine is deflagration. It's burning as opposed to explosion. That's the easiest way to explain it. Which brings us, happily enough, to what can go wrong. And that would be knock, okay? Knock is really bad for an engine, particularly when it happens at high speed and big throttle inputs. And by high speed, I don't mean 100 k's an hour. I mean lots of RPM, okay? Like five, 6,000 RPM, 4,000 RPM would be enough. And big throttle inputs, because what happens then is you can catastrophically destroy your engine. You can melt through the piston, you can burn the valves, whatever. None of it's good. And knock is basically the process of combustion happening at the wrong time. See, in a gasoline engine, a petrol engine, the spark plug is the initiator of the combustion process. And it's really bad, therefore, if the combustion process kicks off of its own volition because the pressure and the temperature somewhere inside the chamber is hot enough to make the fuel burn in an uncontrolled way so that it's set off without the spark plug. When that happens, okay, the flame front from the unscripted combustion can run into the flame front from the scripted part of the combustion and cause a much bigger shock wave and the pressure can rise dramatically in the cylinder before the piston is in the right place and before the crankshaft is over the top dead centre point and in a position to be pushed down. And all of that is bad. In the domain of good and bad in engine operation, that's pretty bad when that happens. So you want to avoid knock at all costs. And one of the best ways of making your engine knock is to use an octane rating of fuel in the tank that is lower than the manufacturer recommends. 
So if you open the fuel flap and it says premium unleaded only, which is a sort of industry code for 95 RON fuel or above, if you put 91 in that vehicle, then let's say it's some high performance car and you take it to a track and you give it a big thrashing on the track with lots of high RPM and lots of big throttle inputs, as you would, then that is the textbook way to destroy the engine because it's not designed to operate with fuel like that. The fuel will not resist the knocking process. It'll do lots of knocking in the chamber. You'll likely melt through a piston or burn a valve and that's going to be an expensive day at the racetrack. So the number one piece of advice I can give you about using a car is never put fuel in the car that is lower than the octane rating recommended by the manufacturer. I drive a 2008 Mazda CX-9 3.7 V6 with 250,000 country kilometres. It still runs and drives well serviced regularly. I've started noticing engine knock when the engine is cold running 91 octane. Initially I thought the engine was starting to die but other owners suggested running the car on higher octane fuel. So I tried E10, 94 Ron. So far, I have not noticed any engine knock. Also, I noted a slight increase in fuel range of about 10% on a full tank, which I thought is a bit odd considering E10 would have less energy density. Okay, so the first observation I would make there generally to anybody who thinks they're hearing engine knock in an old engine, particularly when it's cold, because cold generally is something that mitigates knock. So if you think you're experiencing knock in a cold engine with big Ks, rule out the possibility that the noise is not actually something else, like additional bearing clearance due to mechanical wear and tear in things like the rods, or there might be extra clearance in the valve train, or, you know, things of that nature. There can even be deposits inside the combustion chamber, carbon deposits that hit together when the engine is cold, and that can cause that sort of noise as well. So I'd be ruling out all of that before just jumping to the conclusion that, oh my God, my engine is knocking. However, I I'd have to say that if your engine has been doing what you presume is knocking on 91 and then you put E10 or 95 in the car and the noise goes away, then hey, you probably have cured it and it probably was knocking. So you don't need to worry about it anymore. But what you do need to acknowledge is that no matter how gentle these 250,000 country Ks have been and no matter how regularly you service the car, you've still done six laps of the planet in that vehicle and that engine has been rotating rather a lot in that time and you've got to expect it to start making noises. And most noises that engines make as a consequence of building up the Ks are completely inconsequential. What you want to do is be aware of the normal sounds of your engine and anything that gets dramatically worse in a short spate of time, short space of time, you need to get that investigated as a priority if you want your engine to live as long as possible. But you have to say to yourself, A V6 with 250,000 Ks on the clock, it's living life on the edge and something is going to go wrong with it in the foreseeable future or the powertrain or whatever because nothing lasts forever and I blame the second law of thermodynamics principally for that. First question, are modern engines built to a point where there is a fine line between maximum compression and power versus standard octane 91 fuels? I suggest it's all a little bit more complex than that. If you're designing an engine, okay, what you start with is the performance targets and the fuel economy targets, and you have to take note of what markets the vehicle's going to operate in and what fuel standard you're going to design the engine to operate on. So is it going to be designed for 91, which is the base model fuel here, or 95, which is the base model petrol, for example, in Europe? And if it's in Europe, then when you bring that car into Australia, you either have to retune it to run on 91 or you have to stipulate that the owner must use a minimum of 95. So there's that. But when you think about the engine operating, you know, when the engine is just doing its thing, it operates generally at the point of incipient knock by advancing the timing. So it's in a a feedback loop scenario, okay? So the computer keeps advancing the timing, advance, 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 advance. And there's this thing called a knock sensor in the engine, which is a glorified kind of acoustic microphone. And it has the world's most boring job, which is just listen and listen and listen for engine knock. 
and when it detects engine knock, it sends a short email to the engine control computer and that says, hey, back the timing off a bit, dude. And the engine control computer does that and then it starts advancing and advancing and advancing again until it gets another email from the knock sensor, repeat for 250,000 friggin' kilometres. Okay, so it's a fairly monotonous process, but it works really, really well. And obviously, all these other engine design parameters play into that, like the compression ratio and whether or not it's turbocharged and all of this stuff, okay? So the pressure in the cylinder and the temperature in the cylinder and the knock resistance of the fuel, which is really what the octane rating is all about, they all play together. And in practice, because you can't change any of those things, you've got a particular fuel going into the engine at a particular time. It has a particular compression ratio. The only thing you can adjust on the fly, if you like, from a millisecond to millisecond basis, is the ignition advance. So that's what the engine does. Just to detain you momentarily on octane rating and what that really is, here in Australia, we use this thing called RON, which is the Research Octane Number. It's a particular test, and you do it in a particular test engine, and it goes at 900 RPM, and the engine's got variable compression ratio. So let's say you've got a beaker full of this unknown fuel here, and you want to know what its octane rating is. You tip it into the engine, you wind up the compression ratio until it starts to knock at 900 RPM. And you just make a mental note, or actually, you know, you do it on a computer, whatever, and then you compare that to the knock performance of a blend of two chemicals, okay? Bear with me on this, a bit complex, but hey, even a politician could understand when you explain it this way. The first chemical is a thing called 224-trimethylpentane, which is a recombination of the chemical we call octane. Octane is eight carbons with hydrogens all poked around the outside and 224-trimethylpentane is really five of the carbons in a straight line with three of them added around. Two of them on number two and one of them on number four. It really is that simple. Don't worry about it. It's a chemical called isooctane, 224-trimethylpentane. And then what they do is they blend it with another chemical called N-heptane. I know... <laughs> welcome to my world, it's N-heptane, and they get the blend right, they keep dicking with the blend until the knock performance of the blend is the same as the knock performance of the sample you were just testing. Now, the cool thing about 224-trimethylpentane is that it's 100 octane, and the cool thing about N-heptane, it's zero, okay? So if you get a blend of 91, let's say, just to make it relevant, 91% 224-trimethylpentane and 9% N-heptane, and it performs exactly the same in terms of knock resistance as your unknown sample, then that's 91-octane fuel. That's how this works. And 98-octane is the equivalent in knock performance terms to 98% 224-trimethylpentane and 2%. N heptane. Got it? It really is that simple. But it is, of course, even more complex than this because around the world they use different standards of friggin' course. In America, for example, they use a thing called the anti knock index, which is a product of the research octane number and another test called motor octane number. So M O N instead of R O N. I know. Yay. Welcome to my world. But hey, we're on lockdown, so we might as well go through this as well. The MON test is done in the same engine, but they use preheated fuel, and the revs are different too, I think. It's like 600 RPM instead of 900. Anyway, they do the test exactly the same, apart from those two key differences, preheated fuel and 600 RPM, or whatever it is. Don't quote me. It's something like that. But what you find in practice, even though there's no sort of physical chemistry rule on this that can be basically applied across the board, what you find with typical fuels is that motor octane number is 8 to 12 points lower than research octane number. So 
when you look up a particular fuel, and I looked up one here just uh, just to confirm that because it's hard to get this stuff in the back of your head continuously. When I look at the Shell V Power ninety eight that they use around the world, right? V Power ninety eight, Caltex Platinum ninety eight, SO Mobile Synergy eight thousand, whatever you know, anything that's basically ninety eight Ron, it basically plays like this. It's about 98 RON, but it's about 90 motor octane number. So that's about 94 anti-knock index. That's how this works. Because anti-knock index is the numeric average of research octane number and motor octane number. This, of course, leads to a major problem for you if you are searching for the fuel spec for your car online. Because if you're here in Australia and you're looking in America and you don't appreciate the difference between anti-knock index and RON, you could easily look at an anti-knock index rating over here and presume that it's a RON rating and thereby break the cardinal rule of fuel usage for your car, which is to tip in an octane rating lower than the manufacturer recommends. So for example, let's say you're looking at a website in America and it says 91 and you go, oh great, 91, I'll use 91. If that is 91 anti-knock index, that means it's about 95 or something RON, okay? Don't do that. It's the biggest mistake you can make. And you must appreciate that now that everything's online and you can look up anywhere around the world, if you're researching octane rating for your car, make sure that you look at RON. Because if you're looking at anti-knock index, you are setting yourself up for a big big fall. Second question, are there known cases where an engine initially runs fine on 91, but over time compression exceeds the fuel's capacity to resist auto ignition? Absolutely, that kind of thing happens routinely in engines, and the number one mechanism is carbon deposit, all right? So, if carbon starts to build up in the combustion chamber on the crown of the piston or the ceiling of the combustion chamber on the top of the head there, then basically what happens is that carbon occupies valuable real estate. It takes up volume inside the combustion chamber. So the pressure increases and increases and increases incrementally over time. And eventually you get to a condition where the pressure and the temperature in the cylinder overwhelm the fuel's capacity to resist knock. And you start getting knock whereas you previously would not have in exactly the same fuel spec so that's more likely to occur however in cars that do a lot of city k's because they tend to run richer and do shorter trips and end up more contaminated whereas your kind of running in the country tends to run fairly lean and fairly clean in the upper cylinder head area so i wouldn't be thinking it's that but there are other causes of engine knock so we might as well detail those just for completeness Number one, we've discussed that, is too low an octane rating, okay? Number two is bad timing. So you could have a faulty knock sensor, essentially. You know, if the knock sensor is not working properly and it's not listening as well as it could or it's completely dysfunctional, then the control computer will keep advancing, advancing and advancing the timing and it'll just keep knocking. So I'd be looking at that if there's a knock problem in your engine. You could have a problem with the mixture as well. So... If the mixture runs too lean, this is another trigger for engine knocking, all right? So running too lean could be not enough fuel delivery through the fuel injectors, and in that 3.7 V6 for the Mazda, it's multi-point injection, so you could end up with varnish on the inside of an injector, and it could reduce the amount of fuel that is actually spraying, and I'd be looking at that, resulting in a lean mixture, or you could have some other kind of deficiency in the inlet air plumbing that results in a lean mixture, I don't know. There could be a source like that. And you could have other things going on with the engine, let's not forget, that make those kind of noises like worn bearings and, you know, even faulty tensioners and pulleys on the uh, auxiliary drive belt can sound like knock. So if you think you've got that sort of problem, I'd be ruling that out as well. Third question, how am I achieving a better fuel range on E10 versus 91 octane fuel? This is the easiest of the questions to answer, okay? And the simple answer is you're not because if the driving is experimentally controlled, like exactly the same, 
then you are not going to be able to achieve the same range. There's 30% less energy per unit volume in ethanol compared with gasoline. And therefore, if you blend it at 10%, there's 3% less energy. And therefore, the range is going to shrink by something like 3%. And even if the engine can claw some of that back by advancing the timing slightly, it may be only clawing back 1%, but you will not be able to achieve a greater range. So that's either a dodgy trip computer prediction or dodgy measurement by you. And I guess the third option is that the driving isn't completely controlled experimentally and you might have changed something about the route that you're taking or the manner of the driving so that the range extension is artificially related to that and not to the disparity between the fuels. With two engines that are similar dimensionally, except for one being turbocharged and the other naturally aspirated, Mazda 2.5 versus 2.5 Turbo Sky Active, the turbo engine having more air pumped in and with more pressure in the cylinders. What effect does static compression have on the different charge densities, etc., to allow for the engine to run on regular? Curious about how this works. Let's ballpark the performance so we know what the hell we're talking about, all right? The Atmo engine is making 140 kilowatts at 6,000 RPM, whereas the turbo engine is making 170 at 5,000. So that power is more accessible. The engine's making more torque at lower revs to achieve that power okay that's substantial but if you think that's good the mid-range performance is even better with the turbo engine and let's put it like this you look at peak torque okay the atmo engine's making four uh, making 252 newton meters at 4000 rpm so 252 at 4000 the turbo engine is making 420 newton meters at 2000 and when you consider what the Atmo engine is doing, it's got that 252 up there at 4,000. It'd be lucky to be making 210 Newton meters back at 2,000. So the turbo engine is essentially making double the power of the Atmo engine back at 2,000 RPM. And it's just going to feel like it's on rails, like it's been taking those prohibited drugs for the Olympics that's no longer happening. And you know, all the way between 2,000 and 5,000, it's just going to feel unstoppable. And the reason for that, okay, is because the turbocharger uses highly energetic exhaust flow that would otherwise just be farted out the exhaust pipe and it uses it to spin up a compressor. And the compressor compresses inlet air and allows more air to go into that turbocharged engine than you could ever suck with an Atmo engine. And this in turn allows you to burn more fuel, okay? And that gives you more performance. So that's the basics of what's going on here. But I'd suggest the fuel doesn't give a shit about any of that. All it cares about is what are the conditions like during the squeeze phase of suck, squeeze, bang and blow. So what the designers have to do is they have to engineer squeeze in both engines, the Atmo and the turbo engine, so that it doesn't exceed the conditions required for knock resistance using 91 because both of those engines are tuned to run on 91 octane fuel. What this means for those two engines, of course, is that the static compression ratio of the turbo engine must be less than the static compression ratio of the Atmo engine. And by that I mean we're just considering the mechanical compression of the piston sweeping up in the cylinder, volume at bottom dead centre compared with volume at top dead centre. Because in the turbo engine, obviously, you're adding additional pressure by virtue of the compressed inlet airflow all of which combined not to exceed the maximum knock resistance of the 91 fuel air mixture across a variety of operating conditions. So obviously you have to have lower compression ratio in the turbo engine compared with the Atmo engine, otherwise you just exceed that knock resistance capability and the engine would be pinging its tits off right up to the point where it blows up and Manufacturers are generally philosophically opposed, I think you'd find, to that sort of thing happening on a widespread basis, although there are notable exceptions. So let me know what you think. Is it worthwhile drilling down into these seemingly esoteric and some would say boring issues during these socially isolated times when many of us have a lot more spare time than usual? 
And specifically, if you've got something, some burning issue that's just like an itch that you can't friggin' scratch, let me know. And perhaps I will come down here into the fat cave and we can undress it together. 